Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's like having an insect buzzing around your ear, this thing. It's very strange. Um, it's a delight to be here in Halifax, uh, the friendliest city in Canada. Uh, well, it's I know we didn't. Well, it's between you and Victoria, okay? It's, it's, it's one or the other. But either way, look, it's great to be in Canada as well. Um, home of the uh, Federal Privacy Act of Canada. Um, and I know this because every public official you speak to, particularly every federal public official, insists that you and everybody else knows it. Um, and I'll give you an anecdote about this. It's not the first time this has happened. Um, uh, when, when, just by way of background, you probably know this. If you talk to any uh, federal officer, as soon as uh, you require any information, whatever, of any nature, they will always say, uh, Federal uh, Privacy Act, can't do it. And this didn't actually have a bearing on me until yesterday when uh, my colleague uh, Ed, at the back of the room there, looking still quite disheveled and, 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 and frightened, uh, he, he and I were coming through the border here in friendly uh, Halifax, and he made the error, the heinous error of admitting that he had brought in some chocolate. All right, dairy product, and of course it's a gateway uh, substance to uh, class A narcotics. So, <laughs> you know, this is, this is a logic to everything. Right, so rather than just suggesting that he get rid of these chocolates in the nearby bin, they asked, asked him, get, get this, so this, is, this is trust, asked him to stop in at customs on the way out and have a chat with them. Uh, he's an honest man, is Ed, and he, he actually, rather than just walking past, you know, they've got nothing to do, they're just sitting there. Um, he actually went and he said, they, they've, uh, they've asked me to have a chat. Hilariously, of course, this is all based on trust because this man is now a suspect chocolate uh, trafficker. Um, they said, your, your, uh, your, your colleague here, was he asked uh, as well? And he said, no. They're now asking a suspect whether his colleague has been asked by immigration to talk to customs, right? Now, in Europe, we, uh, I'm not saying this is a bad thing to, to base border security on trust. I just think this is the sort of thing that you'll find out, you'd, 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 you'd laugh about in you know, Family Guy or South Park. And um, so I left. And after an hour and a half, uh, I started to ferret round to find out where Ed uh, had gone. I asked uh, a, 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 uh, one of the border police, uh, one of the uh, federal police, had a dog, uh, and I said, look, I, my friend, he's, uh, he's, he's through there. And he said, I can't tell you anything, Federal Privacy Act. I said, I don't want to know anything. I just want to know, my friend, I can't tell you anything. But then they go to the second level, is if you start actually insisting that the Federal Privacy Act has got nothing to do with it, they say, sir as loud as they can, so the whole terminal can hear. <laughs> so he assured me the Federal Privacy Act prevented him from reassuring me that my friend, uh, who has still not been named, was okay. He said, I'll just tell you the flight has not cleared. And he winked, and then he left. And the dog, the dog was totally cool, you know, calm, confident. It knew the Federal Privacy Act, so it didn't have to put this act on. <laughs> um, so, so here we are, and we're crawling now toward two hours uh, while, while the, the chocolate trafficker is in, in custody. And, um, uh, and Mr. Big was outside just smoking in the, in the, in the ice, you know, cool. And um, uh, I finally, I had enough of this. So I went to another policeman who assured me uh, that the Federal Privacy Act meant that he couldn't do anything. But if I went to see the superintendent of customs, Superintendent of Customs may, subject to the Federal Privacy Act, be able to help me. So after a while, I got to see that. Has anybody actually met the Superintendent of Customs at Halifax? She's got a merit badge in the Federal Privacy Act, level three, which means you can actually put humiliation and sarcasm into, into your interpretation of the Federal Privacy Act. You need a level three merit badge for that, otherwise it's just... Assertiveness is level two and loudness is level one. Um, so she loudly proclaimed in front of the entire office that the Federal Privacy Act meant that she could not in any way divulge any information to satisfy me one way or the other of the status of the friend who I might not have or they might not have somewhere 
Uh, she couldn't tell me. Finally, she cracked and said, well, this hypothetical person may be in for secondary examination. I think you can guess what secondary examination means. <laughs> I'll come to some more vivid details in a moment. But um, here's what happened. Um, if, if, just in case you want a behind-the-scenes tour of what, uh, you know, if you admit you've got chocolate coming through the border. Um, first, they uh, quizzed him about the chocolate. This is very important. There's a very professional quizzing. Um, they asked a lot of details. They went through his bag. Indeed, there were a few Maltesers at the bottom of the bag, <laughs> right? Bang to rights. But they thought, well, okay, we found the contraband on him, these Maltesers. We'll now take this to the second level and do a full scan of all of his possessions, which they did, and uh, this is where it gets really controversial. They found traces of cocaine. Traces of cocaine. Ladies and gentlemen, I have got traces of cocaine on me. I don't get invited to the same party as Ed does, but practically everybody in a major urban center, often through uh, contact through clothes, um, through lots of socializing, uh, through banknotes in particular, as you know, uh, almost the majority of which have got traces of class A narcotics. Um, but traces were discovered. Aha, we go to level three. Level three means that once they have found traces of narcotic on this chocolate smuggler, um, they then are able to go to the secondary examination. Now, I wish Ed sort of was, was, was not so shaken so he could, he could explain the hilarity of this. It essentially is this. They ask you, like some slow pole dance, on, you know, to the, to the tune of the stripper, to remove one item of clothing at a time. <laughs> Very... Very sensually, one no. Now, sir, remove your left sock. <laughs> Take down the boxes. <laughs> and so it went on for half an hour. Now, he's stark naked in front of these officers now. Um, this poor young guy who's never done anything wrong in his life apart from going perhaps to the wrong party, or the right one, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, and he, um, so... They then asked him to sort of do a bit of a dance. They said, do, a, do some knee bends for us. You know, do, do some knee bends. So he's, he's like an epileptic Cossack <laughs> in front of all of these officers. Now, you imagine how humiliating this is. Until finally, after they decided there was nothing inside him, they asked him, sir, could you lift your... Could you lift your... So he lifted his scrotum all right, to save them the embarrassment of actually saying the word. And then he was basically told to get dressed and go. There was no apology, there was nothing. Now, this kind of shattered me to the core because I've always seen Canada as a warm-blooded place and the Canadian uh, Privacy Act, the Federal Privacy Act, is something that would help human relations and society. Uh, to see it used as a shield against decent human relations and customer relations was shocking, to say the least. Um, they didn't even confiscate the chocolates, you know that. They're still in his bag. All right, so uh, what was this all about? Now, I ask myself first, and I'll talk to the... the I'm seeing the Federal Privacy Commissioner's uh, staff for a briefing on, on Friday in Ottawa, and I, I will ask them this. What on earth possesses the border security people to apprehend somebody on one count, one uh, justification, and then essentially leverage every possible uh, position they can take to intensify a search when there is no prior suspicion whatever. Now, traces of cocaine, I'm going to say yes. I also say that 30% of all the baggage coming through an international airport will have traces of cocaine. You can't just say that's your justification. Like all causes for data processing and for intrusion, you have to have something else. There must surely be something more that you can add to triangulate 
an evidential foundation which can be, a, 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 can be used to, to in, justify, to warrant such extraordinary intrusion. Now, apart from the Three Stooges style hilarity of the way the border actually operates here in terms of processing suspects, uh, I, I would say that what you've got there is, is, is a cause for some form of fairly serious investigation. It sounds to me like the border control at Halifax, and I'm not saying that they're unique, but there is something fundamentally wrong. And I'm not, I know this has nothing to do with privacy, but I would have thought it was a nice thing to do to actually say sorry to somebody that you just actually detained for two hours and made do a Cossack dance in the nude, you know? Uh, I would have thought that, okay, you don't want to actually admit that you were wrong, and that's why police rarely apologize, as you know. They wait for the courts to force them to do that. Yes, otherwise, there's an admission. But since he can't sue them anyway, I would have thought that somebody could have said something a little bit soothing to somebody who is shaking and in real fear. So to the superintendent of customs at Halifax, <laughs> I've, got to come to, I've got to go through there again tomorrow, I've just realized. Um, <laughs> she's a lovely girl. Uh, yeah, please get your act together. And please, please, you know, when somebody like me comes up and says... Uh, no, please, don't, don't recite the Federal Privacy Act. Yes, I, I, I kind of was there. I, I sort of know it. You don't need to tell me. Please just do the right thing as a human being because that's what this whole privacy thing is about. If I see her tomorrow, I'll have a word. Doubtless, I'll see her for a few hours tomorrow in, 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 in her, her care. But here I am with that long-winded introduction. This is, not, this is why you haven't got a slideshow, you see. It's lucky you didn't, because I couldn't have had that rant that you've enjoyed so much. <laughs> um, but there is something, there is a reason why uh, there's a point to all of this, which is uh, we're, we've just launched a report in the last hour. Um, it was supposed to be yesterday, but the wonderful thing is I can now launch it here on this stage. Now, it's a report that the London School of Economics has just published. Uh, and uh, that I authored, and it's, it's, it's called Predictions for Privacy. And I, what I did was I went out and I interviewed nearly 200 uh, privacy specialists, experts, pundits from across the world, 19 countries, to try and project what's going to happen uh, over the next year for privacy. Now, this is folly. Anybody who says that they can read the future is normally a nutcase, or they're trying to sell something, or get a grant. That's another reason why they do it. Let's project, let's give us 50,000 bucks, we'll tell you the future. Then, of course, by then, the uh, period's already ended because it's taken a year to get the report together. But we thought, let's try it. Let's see if we can't, just for a 12-month period, identify what the trends, the trends and the themes are of privacy. Now, it's very interesting. Um, if you go to privacysurgeon.org, you, by the way, can download the report, privacysurgeon.org. Uh, just as, as, as the words spell. Um, but what you find is something which, which I found quite satisfying, actually. And that is if you look at the, the trends, the themes, and the way the themes are moving toward more controversial or less controversial privacy issues, you're seeing that consent and transparency are very clearly coming through as more controversial. It's, it's, it's reflected in public policy, in media coverage. Um, in public opinion. You're seeing some interesting themes, like, for example, scale, the size of something, um, uh, the centralization of data. These are uh, themes which are becoming less controversial because people are uh, they're immersed in them. You know? Facebook, you know, one billion profiles, uh, 70 you know, terabytes of data here, or you know, people just, it's, it's becoming so passe to hear these figures. But transparency has become the new uh, language of controversy. And consent, uh, very much a partner to that. Now, you saw this, if you take a look at um, Instagram's smartphone, uh, Instagram's terms and conditions. You remember that right at the end of last year? Look at the global backlash that occurred when people realized effectively they were having one pulled on them in secret that they had things being done to them without their permission.
permission. Now, that global response was swift uh, and, and, and you know, somewhat effective. The same with the ITU's um, internet control uh, plans. People have started to wise up to the way these organizations uh, take away their rights. And they don't like it. And so it's very good to see those themes. But within all these themes, you might want to, uh, to know that all of the world's, well, a lot of the world's privacy experts believe that mobile, coming back to what John was talking about, is going to be the number one hot issue of this year. Particularly apps and geolocation and the marriage of the two. Um, my friend, uh, I have a friend, I won't name him, uh, GSMA, the, big, the global mobile phone provider uh, industry organization. He says, if you knew what was coming down the road in terms of geolocation and the ability for geolocation to work in multiple dimensions, multiple dimensions, granulated, granular uh, and, and intelligent, <coughs> you uh, would be, would be you know, surprised, he said, is the word he used. Very understated man. He said, there are so many legal issues that surround this. Because when you start marrying granular, multi-dimensional geolocation data with what's already on the system, uh, you can see all sorts of potential there for new income streams. Now, what we discovered, well, what we confirmed in this report was something that we knew from before which is the race is now on to capture the margins in advertising. And the margins can be captured through innovative ways that kind of push the boundaries of privacy. So if you say, you know what, we're not just going to push um, advertising through your mobile, but we're going to run geolocation-based advertising that is predictive and intelligent and can do you know, triple level profiling of any conversation which is going on or any movement that is taken. This takes Foursquare to another, another dimension. The thing is that we, what occurs then is that an entirely new margin of advertising is opened up. Now this is the way that entrepreneurs in the market who are trying to you know, make their living from advertising are going to compete with the likes of Google. Now, Google has done extraordinarily well at capturing the global market for advertising. But like all corporations, it becomes a bit of a juggernaut when it gets to a certain point. That's when your entrepreneurs come in, and that's when the real dangers start occurring. Because the entrepreneurs are going to be going to the venture capital companies and saying to the VCs, give me 50 million, I'll turn it into half a billion if we can crack this margin here. If we can fuse data along the following stream, we can generate over 10 years or say three years, you know, 40 billion of revenue potential here. The VCs are all ears. Privacy is their problem. Because while they can go to the VC companies and say, yeah, no one gives a damn really. You know, no one cares. You know, people just want this cool stuff. Um, and the VCs, unfortunately, 90% of them are still all ears because they're thinking, look, we've got to find a way. We can, look, if Google gets away with it, <coughs> if Google can get away with it, I'm sure we can. Well, let's cross that bridge when they come to it. I've, I've heard VCs say that before. Look, let's get it to stage two, right? Uh, if we get it to the second stage, that's the bridge we'll cross later. But one way or the other, we'll, we'll deal with privacy. Now, this gets so fascinating because you're dealing essentially with billions in venture capital, and you're dealing with hundreds of billions in, in potential revenue margins from advertising. And that little conduit called privacy is your non engine well, technically it's your non-engineering con um, conduit. That's what they have to get over. Sadly, uh, there isn't enough privacy engineering around the place. This is, you know, the ability to uh, find, a, find an engineering solution to a problem that still will give you the revenues. Uh, we need to make, and this is one of the things this report says, we've got to bridge this engineering gap. We've got to see privacy not as a solution that inhibits advertising margins at the expense of a few zealots. It's an engineering uh, uh, challenge 
that will deliver privacy for all, regardless of where they stand philosophically or ideologically. And the engineers can do this. And I think that just, just looking through these nearly 200 submissions, I am getting a feeling that we are moving now to a point where finally engineers will be able to see the benefit in creating true solutions. I mean, at the moment we've got, and I don't know if it was privacy by, by design or, or, um, or any of the, the privacy uh, engineering solutions talked about earlier today. As, um, if you look at privacy by design, that's the cool hip, you know, privacy is full of cool phrases. Privacy by design being one of them. The problem is you can't really achieve it without the engineering uh, block, you see. Privacy by design means that from the very uh, creation stage, the concept stage of an organization or a product, you build privacy in at every layer. You actually embed privacy into the fabric of, of what you do uh, as an organization. Now that is very difficult to achieve in a competitive environment. But once the engineers start to say, wait a minute, hang on, we think we can find a technical way to achieve, to, 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 to achieve those uh, outcomes. And you start getting a resonance in the investment sectors. You start getting a resonance in the legal sectors. People start to see that privacy isn't an inhibitor. It's something which is value added. And if we can lick the problem, it means more revenue, it means more capital, it means more investment and more security and trust. And we can do that. And I believe, just, it's only a short report. I mean, it's one report out of 18 billion that's going to be released this year. But I'm getting a feeling that this could very well be the year where we start to see that ship turn. And this conference, I think, is symptomatic of that. I think it's proof. I mean, this is a record conference, isn't it? Look at everybody here. There's excitement in this room. There's a sense that there's an important issue and an issue that has a future that is relevant to everybody here and in the world. And you should have been around 10 years ago. It was nothing like this. This was an elite niche market, a subject that very few people were interested in. You know, I couldn't, look, 25, 30 years ago, I couldn't collect enough people to fill a phone box. You know? And now, you know, you look at Victoria. I'm speaking at a conference with General Michael Hayden, mm -hmm. um, uh, former CIA and NSA director. This is going to be a very uh, entertaining joint keynote session. I hope they uh, stream it. Um, you know, there's 1,000 people, 1,100 people. They can't move for people. Um, this is wonderful. It shows we are now dealing with a proper economic sector, an entrenched right, and something which is of value to the whole world. Um, and, you know, I've been depressed over the last five years about, well, who wouldn't, you know, when you look like me? But the thing is that I was depressed over the last five years about privacy and thinking, are we really going in the right direction? Have I wasted my life? What happened to the days when I could have been a pool shark or a truck driver or, a, you know? Um, I wanted to be a great author, and that's, did I throw my life away? And for, you know, for five years, I thought, you know what, this is going all, this all going to hell. Now I believe things are changing. First Christmas, I've got through, you know, without the requirement for self-medication with whiskey, because I'm too excited to do work for the following year. So I, I don't know, that's one man's experience. But I hope that all of you uh, are becoming optimistic, because I think... If we meet again next year, I hope that I can say, I told you so, and I hope that you can say to me, wow, you were too understated. Boy, did we have a year. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.